We, uh, we are journeying through uh, this section of All In, and for those of you that are following, we've been focusing on community. Um, and when I think of community, it's not lost on me, and I hope it's not lost on you, that it is community be belonging is probably one of the core desires that we all have. I believe that we all want to belong. I believe that we all want to know, and we want to be known. And yet, with everything that we long for, and with everything that happens in community, it can be the hardest thing to deal with. We can have our greatest struggles in community, and we can have our greatest wins in community at all, as well. And we've been focusing on this passage as foundational for all our relationships. And that is this, and say it with me, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Say that again. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And in the beginning, we looked at servanthood. We looked, because this passage, when you take it on a little further, it says that Jesus, it talks about how Jesus was a servant. And we talked about how in community we need to serve. That, we, that needs to identify, that needs to mark us. It needs to be in our character because that's who Jesus was. We talked about friendship and the characteristics of strong friendship. Uh, Jen led us uh, with this painting that Rosanna did uh, through taking offense. And in a couple weeks, Jen's coming back to do part two of her talk and building on this, on this, on this piece of art. And then Kevin talked about, uh, from Romans 12, talked about what the body looks like and how it moves and acts together. And then last week, we talked about forgiveness. And it's interesting, the conversations I had about forgiveness last week the, the two things came up through text messages and a couple of phone calls I had. First of all, this really uh, gripped a few people, that you will never have a relationship where forgiveness is not needed. You will never sustain a relationship where forgiveness is not given. You will never have a relationship where forgiveness is not needed. You will never sustain a relationship where forgiveness is not given. And this talk on forgiveness is so big and it affects so many of us. But if we are going to walk in community, if we are going to learn to have healthy relationships, we have to receive and extend forgiveness. And the bar is this, and we talked about it last week, that we are to forgive, we are to bear with each other, forgive one another. If any of you have, if any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. That's the bar. That we forgive based on how we've been forgiven. And I'm, I am completely convinced that we need to settle in our souls that we are radically loved and that we are radically forgiven. And we will struggle forgiving others through this whole lifetime if we don't settle once and for all that we have received a forgiveness that is just out of this world that is so amazing and so unconditional. Well, conditional on us asking for it. But to have the forgiveness of Christ for each one of us, that's the bar that we are to forgive as we have been forgiven. And as we journey through this together as a faith community, I've been praying that the Spirit of Christ would be working deeply in you and deeply in me. Because I'm aware, and I hope that you are living with the same awareness that our ancient enemy does not want to see us living an all-in lifestyle. He does not want to see us as individuals being devoted to the teachings of Christ. He doesn't want to see us as community being devoted to the teachings of Christ. He doesn't want to see us as individuals walking in healthy community. And he does not want to see us corporately walking in healthy community. Because if we do... If we get this right, it will transform us. It will move us to be more and more like Christ. If we get this right collectively, it will change our, our community, both here as a family of faith, and it will change the community that we are called to serve with, if, that we are called to serve if we get this right. And... I mean, our ancient enemy does not want that to happen. And I believe that it's not something to be afraid of, it's just something to live with an awareness in, because 
I have found and I've had conversations with people that as they are trying and, and, really, and really trying to build healthy community and even to, to not take offense and to walk in forgiveness and to serve and to build friendships, the craziest little things are happening. And I don't believe it's by chance. Because we, are, we will become so strong and the amazing things will happen if we get this right, if we, know, if we learn how to move in healthy community. Today we're going to focus on another characteristic of healthy community. I believe a characteristic that has forgiveness is vital, as vital, so is this when it comes to community. This characteristic is modeled over and over in the scriptures. And it is also another characteristic that is commanded. We are commanded to forgive. We are commanded to bear with each other and forgive one another. And this is a command as well. And this command permeates so much of the New Testament. And yet it's something, unfortunately, I don't think we see in community. I don't see, as a pastor, and I struggle to say this, I don't see us doing well at this. I don't see us as a culture doing well at this. It has, this characteristic has the power to change the, tra the trajectory of a person's life. I've seen it in my life. I've seen it in so many other people's lives. And I believe that if we are going to see healthy community here at the bridge, this characteristic has to become part of us. And the characteristic is encouragement. Today we're going to talk about encouragement. But the reality is, I'm going to start with where we're going to finish today. We cannot give something that we haven't received. And we've talked about that time and time again. I can't give forgiveness if I haven't really received forgiveness. I can't give love. I can't give grace. I can't give mercy if I haven't really received it. I cannot encourage if I have not first received encouragement. So stand with me. I'm going to ask for a moment of just where we quietly read Scripture. And we're going to look at Philippians 2. So I'm going to ask you to stand. And I want us to, uh, you're going to read this quietly, and then we're going to read it out loud, and then we're going to pray together. But I want you to look at this, because is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Yes. That encouragement changes everything. All right, Philippians 2, 1 to 5. I'm going to read it through twice. Once in the NLT and then once in the message, because I like the languages. It kind of gets your brain wrapped around what's being said here. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and one purpose. And don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take interest in others too. You must have the same attitude, that of Jesus Christ. And this is the message. <clears throat> if you've got anything at all of following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being a community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart... If you care, then do me a favor. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push away. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourself long enough to help a, uh, lend a helping hand. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. Let's pray before we worship. Father, thank you for the focus of All In. Thank you for the focus of the community. And I would add, even revival in this community uh, here in Bancroft. I just pray that you would use uh, the bridge to uh, have your way. And, and you say that they'll know, know us because of our love. So help us to break down the barriers, maybe even the barriers of all the COVID stuff we went through the last few years where we kind of protected ourselves, kept people out, help us to be vulnerable once again and intimate with
with our church family and allow your Holy Spirit to do its work, not only in this community right here at the bridge, but also um, in this community here in Bancroft. So we commit this time of worship to you right now. We ask that your Holy Spirit would show up and speak to us individually where we're at. And we ask uh, that you would help us to worship you in spirit and truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm sitting there thinking about the talk that I'm bringing, thinking about how we can only give encouragement when we've been encouraged. And songs like that, like Death Arrested, that uh, because of what Jesus has done, we're free. We are so free. If there is any encouragement from belonging to Christ, is there, sorry, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? And the answer is, yes. any comfort from His love? Yes. Any fellowship together in the Spirit? Yes. Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Try to. <laughs> Try to. <laughs> and I think this is the thing, right? Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. And we've been talking about this, and you'll notice that the mirror's changed a bit, and there's some writing on here that we'll get to later, but we've been talking about this, that we, through this series on community, when it comes to relationships, so often we are guilty of looking through a rather dirty mirror, or dirty window I mean, blaming everybody else for the relationships that are failed, for the fact that we can't have healthy community. And we've been asking ourselves that through this series, that we actually pause and look in the mirror, and, and every time we do, when we sit quietly and look at ourselves in the light of Scripture, when we sit quietly and let God speak to us, we see things that we don't like, and it's hard, but it's the starting place. And after a while, things start to shift, and we start to see that Christ actually being formed in us, and the reflection isn't so, quite, isn't so uh, hard to handle. And today, I want us to think about, as we think about encouragement, this is where things kind of shift, and it's not that we start looking out at this dirty part of the window, we actually start looking out at the clear part of the window as we think about how it is that I am involved in encouragement. It's something, it's kind of both here, that I stand in the mirror and, and gaze at Christ and say, okay, I receive encouragement from you, and then I look out and say, now how do I give this? How do I bring encouragement in community? Simple definition of encouragement is this, that encouragement means the action of giving someone support, confidence, courage, or hope. The action of giving someone support, confidence, courage, or hope. Encourage, to actually put courage in someone. And I love how simple and how powerful this word is. The church in Thessalonica had it. They had this encouragement. And they must have had it down, and it was so obvious, because Paul, when he wrote to the, to the church at Thessalonica, he said, you guys are rock stars in this. And anybody that watched the Super Bowl, I don't care, I'm using the word rock stars. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Therefore, encourage, like Paul is looking at these people and he's going, you guys are amazing. You have been encouraging. You keep putting encouragement out there. You support people. You, have, you build confidence in people. You bring courage. You bring hope. Keep doing it. And so when you encourage someone, you are actually putting these things in. You are causing people to feel supported, to have confidence, to have courage, and have hope. And when you've been encouraged... Someone actually, and everyone has can think about this, the times that you and I have been encouraged, where someone actually did this, where they spoke confidence, courage, or hope, they gave us confidence. We all have stories about this. And the thing that, I, that I'm always constantly amazed at is the people that we think of. And I have a list of people. There are so many people that when I think of encouragement, I have a picture in my mind of them. And I think about those people who at certain points in my life spoke confidence into me, 
spoke hope into me, spoke courage into me. And the trajectory of my life tra changed drastically. I remember, and I'll be very quick, like bumping into high school in grade 9, I mean, I, was, I know I'm so tall now, <laughs> but <laughs> I, believe it or not, I was shorter than this in grade 9. And I could walk under the senior boys volleyball net without ducking in grade 9. Now I have to duck. <laughs> but when I got into high school, I was lost. I was awkward. I was struggling to fit in. I really, and I'm going to talk about this later, but it wasn't good. And, and I got into sports. And I started playing volleyball because I could miss more school if I played volleyball. The soccer team, the volleyball, I got posted. I made both, and I'm like, cold weather, short season, outdoors, forget that. I made the volleyball team. <laughs> They're indoors, and I get to miss a lot more school. But I started playing, and the senior boys volleyball coach, Ron Foster, saw me. And he came up, and there was a couple other things that happened in the school during Spirit Week. And he came up to me, and he took me aside, and he said, Steve, I see huge potential in you. And he said, I'm going to talk to the junior boys coach, because I want you to come to senior now. And I was like, wow. Because the volleyball at the high school uh, for boys back then, like that was the sport you wanted to be in. And this coach saw something in me and called it out. And when he did, he got me. I was all in. Fast forward and we're married and Angie and I are living in North York, uh, an apartment right at the Don Valley in the 401. And, and we are attending a church, and this gentleman <clears throat> by the name of Sidney Hoffman, who, oh, gosh, I'm exhausted, so you might see a couple of tears today. <laughs> um, Sidney Hoffman, who founded Bridal Grove Bible Chapel, took me aside and said, at, you know, how old was I, 22? <clears throat> took me aside and said, Steve, I see potential. And it was just like, oh my gosh. And he encouraged me. Fast forward to standing on a golf course in 1991, 1992, and one of my best friends, Eric Shaban, he's standing there and he says, Steve, why aren't you <clears throat> in full-time ministry? And it landed. I never thought about it. I'm like, me? <laughs> Do this full-time? The power of encouragement. It is, man, Life-changing. We've all had those. We've all had those moments. And the thing about encouragement is it's not only powerful, it's attractional. It is like a magnet. People who encourage draw people to them. People who discourage repel we walk away, we avoid discouraging people and discouraging environments. But all of us, we are like magnets, like moths to the light when it comes to an encouraging environment and encouraging people. The question, as you sit here today, are you an encouraging person or a discouraging person? If you are not encouraging, you are discouraging. There's no neutral ground here. If you are not an encouraging person, you are a discouraging person. And if you're struggling to identify with whether or not you're a person who discourages, let me help you. There are three types of discouraging people. There's probably more. I'm only going to talk about three. And it's three that I know very well. <laughs> okay? I've experienced these. Uh, too often. The first type of discouraging person is this, the black hole. The black hole. These people never discourage, but they never encourage either. You know that moment, you know, you did your best, and you're just waiting for that, oh, that was awesome. And you look at them, and they're just like, 
Or you're just like, you're just hoping, well, maybe they'll say, in that moment, when you made that play, or when you said that, or when you sung that, or in that, that one note, just that one note, you nailed it, right? And you're just, you just want something. Or, you know, even if, gee, it's really good you just showed up, right? You just want something, and there's nothing. You can't say that they're discouraging, but you can't say they're encouraging either. But if you're not encouraging, you're discouraging. If you don't make the effort to encourage, you are an emotional black hole. If this is you, the reality is that people closest to you will be most damaged. They so need your affirmation. And because you say nothing, they feel like nothing. Because you say nothing, they feel like nothing. Husbands, wives, parents, grandparents, please pay attention to this. If you don't encourage your kids, they will find environments and people that will. I mean, my parents were amazing, but they either encouraged me or discouraged me. And my sisters hated it. As a boy, I could do just whatever I wanted. <laughs> but I was never discouraged. I had a couple rules. Be home by 11, if not call. That was basically my only rule going up. But I was never, dis I was never discouraged, but I was never <coughs> encouraged. And looking back, that's one of the reasons sports got me. Because there I found affirmation. There I found validation. There I found encouragement that I was looking for. And it wasn't that my parents were bad people. They just, I don't think they, I don't think they knew. And I'm thankful as I look back that sports is where I landed because there was a whole lot of other things that wouldn't have been good. But because sports is where I found that, that's where I landed. Adults don't underestimate the power you can have in a young person's life through encouragement either. My story about volleyball, my story about Sidney Hoffman. I remember Sidney Hoffman, I used to help with the kids club at the church. And there was this little boy who was just, oh my goodness, <laughs> he, <laughs> Ashley I think was his name. Um, and he, oh he was just wild, he was so wild. He was so wild that uh, when I went to the kids club, uh, Awana, it was just him and me. Because <laughs> we needed an adult just to be with him. And, and I'm like, I get you. Because I was you. I was you, right? I was the one that nobody could control at that age. And so we just had all kinds of fun. And I remember one night, Sidney Hoffman was always there. And Sidney at that time, oh, late 70s, I think. Short little guy, kind of like Yoda. Uh, just kind of... And he just had these nuggets of wisdom. And I'll never forget this. The power of encouragement. And that don't underestimate how you can speak into someone's life. He looked at Ashley and he said, Steve, what do you see? And I'm like, what do you mean? He said, what do you see? I said, well, I see Ashley. I see, I said his age and everything. He said, you know what I see? He said, I see someone that could be the next Billy Graham. Ashley's going, he goes, who's that? <laughs> but that was what Sydney did. And as a culture, like, I'm like, I don't see us doing that. I don't see us speaking into people's lives. And we're suffering for it. And we need to raise this value this characteristic back up in our community, here and outside. And you don't underestimate the power you have and how one thing can change a person's life. In high school, I said, when I was 16, I lament sometimes about how nobody in the church got me when I was young. All it would have taken was I see something. But when I was 16, I couldn't lament over that anymore. 
because Kevin Martins. <coughs> Kevin Martin's dad, Gary, saw something. And he said, Steve. And I was like, <laughs> I thought you look at what I was like when I was 16, and I'm going, I, I, you saw something? But he did. And he called it out. And I got involved in youth ministry. I got involved. He, has me, he had me leading. He had me doing stuff. And it changed my life. You might be a black hole. So please, if you are this, you know, you might be a black hole. You don't discourage, but you don't encourage. And because of that, there is this huge silence that screams you disapprove even if you don't. There is no neutral ground when it comes to this. And I hope we understand that. We either encourage or we discourage. And being quiet, being quiet, screams you are nothing. Saying nothing screams you are nothing. There's the truth teller. I don't discourage. They will say, I don't discourage. I just tell the truth. I don't discourage. I just don't lie. I'm not going to tell people what they need to hear. I'm going to tell them the truth. You, are, you use truth as a way to discourage people. As we already read, encourage one another and build each other up. This is the way to speak truth and encouragement, to build truth tellers. The question is, does your truth build people up or tear people down? Because encouragement is a two-edged sword. Encouragement is a pat in the back, the confidence, the hope. It's also a kick in the butt sometimes to smarten up and get back in the game. It's both. And sometimes truth is needed. But when you speak truth, is your truth a weapon to destroy or a gift to strengthen? Ephesians 4, 15 says, speak the truth in love. I think truth tellers here speak the truth and love and they save the love for later. <laughs> If you don't honestly love someone, then the best, for truth tellers, if you don't honestly love someone, then the best strategy is silence. There's the humbler. The humbler. They believe their lot in life is that no one becomes arrogant. It goes something like this. I saw you doing well, and I will declare it, but... There's always a but with the humbler. Everyone is singing their praises, not me. Got to keep them grounded. Got to keep him grounded. Got to keep her grounded. You know, there's a lot of gifts. There's a lot of callings. But nobody has ever been called by God to be the humbler of someone else. And friends, if you are a humbler, that is rooted in arrogance. Because you can't celebrate someone else's greatness. You can't celebrate someone else's greatness. So those are some types of people who discourage. If you're one of those, my question is, will you humbly come to God and say this, God, what are we going to do about this? Because encouragement is a command. Encouragement is a part of healthy community. Encouragement is so powerful and so needed. And as I said, I love this verse, therefore encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Could Paul say that about me? Could he say that about you? Could he say, just keep doing what you're doing? As I mentioned earlier, this thing of this theme, not this theme, this command of encouragement permeates the New Testament. When you look at the life of Jesus, he modeled it. I mean, he lived in community, both with the disciples and with those that were with him. And everywhere he went, people were attracted, were drawn, because he encouraged. His disciples, they got the two-edged sword of encouragement. It was like, come on, you can do this. And then it was, get behind me, Satan. 
And it was the wake-up calls and also the strip, but it was always done in love. And then you look at the writings of Paul. All through the New Testament, every one of his letters, there is a section that he speaks and it's like, you must bear with one another, care, with, care for one another. You must encourage. But how do we do this? How do we encourage? When I was writing this message, like Ange is watching this weekend, it's, just, it's been hard. Like, <laughs> talking about forgiveness last week was hard. And this one, I just couldn't settle. Because I know how powerful this is. And how much we need it in our community. And originally I was drawn, for those of you who know me, I have these documents, these, these, these tools that I use for my own self-development and character checks and things where I'll pull them out and just... Every three months, say, okay, how am I doing? How am I doing? How am I doing? When it comes to purity, how am I doing? When it comes to love, how am I doing? When it comes to humility, how am I doing? When it comes to self-discipline, how am I doing? And I have a few other ones. And I have this, this list here. It's called 10. It's all about empowering and encouraging those that I work with, those that are with me. And there's 10 questions here. And I'll go down them and I'll evaluate myself going, all right, am I doing this? And what I'm called to... Am I encouraging? Am I empowering? Am I giving people hope? Am I giving people confidence? Am I giving people, you know, the support that they need? And, and I'll go down these questions. And I was going to take all ten of these questions and, and morph them a bit and, and make them applicable to what it looks like in relationships. And I had that message written. It was, like, done. And then there was just an uneasiness. Because I'm like, it's too much. Ten? I'll be glad if they remember one. <laughs> you know? But there was this uneasiness. And so I didn't sleep much Friday night. And then sat last night, I made a quick trip to Ottawa yesterday to bring uh, my, one of my princesses home. And then, <clears throat> and then I, uh, you know, I was sitting there, I was working on my talk, and and I was, I was exhausted. I went to bed at 10 to 7. And, I just, and as I went to sleep, I'm like, God, I don't know what I'm doing. At 1 o'clock, I woke up, and I knew what I was doing. And so from 1 o'clock to 3.30, I finished my talk. <laughs> and then I went back to bed and got up at 6. So that's why there's a lot of emotion going on here. One of the reasons. But, as I said, it hit me. Simply. It's simply, I want to focus on this one thing. That I think if we can just start here, it will change everything. And it's simple, but not easy. We have to come to a place where once and for all, we decide to live a life where we control our words. Where... As a faith community, daily, moment by moment, we resolve to choose words that support, that bring confidence, that bring courage, or give hope. The days of using our tongues to tear down instead of building up has to end. This verse must become foundational in our lives. Do not use foul or abusive language. In the New American Version, it says, Let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth. If we just stop there, how many of us would have much to talk about? Let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth. How many conversations, even that you've had today, could you've actually finished if this was foundational? If we were resolved to use our tongues for good, to speak hope, to speak love. He goes on to say, let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Proverbs 18.21 says, The tongue can bring death or life. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. In case you don't get it, here's the message. 
Words kill. Words give life. They're either poison or fruit. You choose. Words kill. Words give life. Words are either poison or fruit. You choose. Have you ever been in a really good mood? And it's just like, I mean, it's one of those zippity doo dah days, right? Like, that, <laughs> well, anybody that's old knows that, right? Walt Disney, zippity doo dah zippity yay, right? It is one of those zippity doo dah days, and you're just on top of the world, and then you walk into a room that is just like, and there is just all this, they're, they're, they're complaining, they're discouraged, they're despair. How long does it take for you to go from zippity doo da to, to actually join in and participate in all the misery? It's so true. Misery finds it likes company. It's so amazing to me how we can go into this black hole of despair and negativity, how we can get sucked in. And it's almost like some people that you are with they're not satisfied until every bit of joy and encouragement is sucked out of your body and soul. That seems to be our world. That seems to be the thing that we fight against. Do you notice that? Do you notice how hard it is to stay hopeful? How hard it is to stay encouraged? How hard it is to have confidence? How hard it is to, to, have, to, to be courageous? Because our culture just wants to pull us down. And I, unfortunately, even though I'm not on media, hear too much of it happening even amongst us. The opposite is true, though. Do you know anyone who encourages, who breathes life, any environments? that you find yourself in that when I'm here, life is just better. Are you a person who encourages or discourages? As we look at this verse, simply, what are your words doing? Our words shape us. They form us. They shape and form the environments and the people around us. They either build up or they tear down. There is no neutral ground. As you reflect on your average day, your average conversations, your involvement in people's life, are there, is there life or death around you? Is there life or death in you? The Apostle James weighs in on this. He says, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest fire is set on fire by a small spark. Man, isn't that true? I can think of the times where I didn't guard my words and the simplest word. The statement that it's out there and you just wish you could grab it and bring it back. And it's too late. And the trouble it causes. The tongue is also a fire, a wild of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life in fire. And it itself, and it and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals and birds, reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue, get this, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father. We just did that. We just sang. We, Tim prayed. Some of you, this morning, had a quiet time. A time of silence and solitude, and you did this. Some of you will do this tomorrow, maybe every day. But what he says next is so true. As I said already, I see it here in our community, both directly and indirectly. 
I see way too much of it even in my life. And I wrestled with this last night. I'm like, God, this has to change. This has to change. And I'm just, my prayer is start here. I, I have to become a person that doesn't just encourage when it comes to staff. It doesn't just encourage when it comes to my close buddies. I have to become a person that encourages, period. Period. He goes on. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father. And with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the spring? Same spring. The answer is no. But somehow we manage to do it. My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear, grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Out of all the words you speak, all the words you text, all the words you post on social media, out of all the words you have spoken, even this day, if you were honest of heart, were the majority creating life, encouraging, building up, or were they bringing, were they bringing support, hope, confidence, courage, or were they tearing down? James reminds us in verse 9, every time we speak to people, we are speaking to someone made in the image of God. Picture this. If Jesus was sitting right here, right now, would your conversation change? If he was here right now, and you had the chance to talk to him, face to face, would the way you talk normally change? Friends, as you look around, he's here. <coughs> Each one of us are created in God's image. As a follower of Christ, for those of you sitting here who say, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, the Spirit of Christ is in you. That has to drastically change how we talk to each other. Because I'm talking to the Spirit of Christ. In you. He's in you. He's in you. Do you see how powerful this is? And do you see how... I mean, this calls for us to repent. <laughs> it, it calls for us to say, God... This is where I was going, and I'm done, and I'm sitting here now. That's all repentance means. I was going there, and now I'm going here. I've actually had to like, personally just repent. God, I am sorry. I have not, I have used this way too much, even this past week, to tear down. I had a conversation with someone today, just about golf, and I was ready to rip somebody a new one, and I'm like... I can't! <laughs> because I'm, I, I don't want my words to tear down anymore. Because it just, I don't want, I want Paul to see me someday and go, <laughs> Steve, you encouraged and you built hope. And I was watching you and just going, keep going, keep going. I don't want to stand someday and hear, Steve, you caused so much trouble. You caused so much hurt. You caused so much pain because you could not control your tongue. The Spirit of Christ is in us. We need to choose to see people as God does. We must let what James says settle in our souls. We must allow the Spirit of Christ to do a work in us. We must come to the place where we allow Jesus to so rule our will that we literally talk to people, see people, and love as he did. How are you doing 
Do you encourage or discourage? If you do not like what you're seeing, and this is hard, because as I looked into the mirror on this one, I didn't like what I saw. And I had to own the truth that this, Jesus says, a good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. An evil produce, person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what's in your heart. That's not easy. Because it's a heart issue. Looking at this verse and coming back to what James says about we worship God and curse people with the same tongue. You and I can have all the language of worship, but if we don't have the language of encouragement, there is something broken in our souls. James is right. He says all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, seas and creature, sea creatures are being tamed and being tamed by mankind, but no human being can contain the tongue. No human being. We can't do it in and, our, in and of ourselves. No human being can tame the tongue. But friends, as a follower of Christ, we are not alone. We are not left to ourselves. No small one can tame the tongue. But there is one that if we surrender to, can tame our tongue. There is one who can transform us so that we live lives and use words to encourage. There is a way for us to do this. There is a way for us to do this. We have to remember that we leak. We leak. How many have ever plugged in their phone at night and when they woke up in the morning it was dead? Are you pointing at somebody? <laughs> well, I, I might, so I, I know as I have on too many occasions. I guess I'm the only one. <laughs> okay, we've got a few more honest people. I discovered the first time, <laughs> you'd think that one that we've done. I discovered the first time that when you plug your phone in, it has to be connected on both ends. <laughs> Because I'm like, oh yeah, was, I'm sure that's plugged in, I just shoved it in, and it's not connected. And so overnight, the slow drain just keeps going. And then it's dead, and doesn't work. The same way that our devices drain, they leak, we have to acknowledge that when it comes to encouragement, when it comes to taming our tongue, we leak. We have talked time and time again that we were created for a relationship. And in our relationship, our vertical relationship with our Heavenly Father forms and informs all other relationships with everyone else. But we can only give what we receive. See, there's something beautiful about being in community. As we think about gathering here today, there is something powerful that happens because just being together we get encouraged we get filled we get strengthened we i hope and pray that every time we gather somehow some way you are encouraged you are strengthened you have hope that you get confidence and we get that not only from singing and not only from praying and not only from messages and things like that but we get it from being in other just being with just being in community so we kind of, you know, like, okay, so we get buoyed up a bit. But it's also this slow drain. <laughs> because being with people can drain you. Being with people can, can deplete you. And if we are not putting ourselves in the place where we are connected to God, where both ends are plugged in, then we just drain and drain and drain. We leak and leak and leak until nothing's left. And how hard is it to control this and anything else when we have not received anything to replenish? This is why solitude and silence is so important. Because 
we are commanded to encourage, to breathe love and support, to breathe love and support, to breathe confidence, to breathe courage, to breathe hope. Therefore, we must stay connected to the one who breathes love, breathes support, breathes confidence, breathes courage, and breathes hope into us. Stay connected to the one who makes us courageous. Being daily in a place where we hear the voice of God, where we receive the love, the grace, the mercy, the forgiveness, where we breathe in all that God has for us so that we can breathe out all He has for us. What we receive for ourselves is the only thing we can give to others. The incredible thing is, when you encourage and build others up, you get stronger because you reap what you sow. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from the sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will have an everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially those in the family of faith. When we give this, it strengthens us. When we receive and give, we get stronger because we reap what we sow. And that's a principle that, goes, that transcends so many things. And friends, this mirror, I don't know if you remember this. This came back to me this week as I had just a, a really tough morning early one morning this week, where I'm like, I'm wrestling with this. Two summers ago, we talked about the man in the mirror. And we talked about, you know, and I, and I keep referencing, and I'm not going to stop, the Shema. Steve, John, Carl, Bob, and everybody. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength with all your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. And we don't do good at loving ourselves. And I was reminded that this week that we have to put ourselves in this mirror where, and it says here, I know you can't read it too clearly, it says, this is God talking, I love you, I'm grateful for you, I have forgiven you. God says that you are a rare and beautiful treasure. God says, I call you to a high standard with appropriate grace and mercy. I have given you a calling and a purpose. I'm cheering for you. And we talked about this, and I'm like, I was reminded of this week that I have to stand in this mirror and say and, and repeat to myself, Steve, I love you. I'm grateful for you. Because that's what Jesus is saying to me. And when I receive that, I can give it. It's not about becoming arrogant. It's not about becoming puffed up. And go, oh, look at me. I love me. No. God's saying, I love you. I love you. I need to receive this. God says, I'm forgiven. Steve, I forgive you. God says, I'm grateful for you. You're a rare and beautiful treasure. You are called to a high standard. I'm a holy God. There's a high standard. But I know that you are like dust. And so there's grace and mercy for the journey. And you have such purpose. And I'm cheering for you. And when that lands, out of that, we can give. As we receive and love ourselves as God loves us, we love out of that. We forgive out of that. We encourage out of that. We're going to close our service with the team coming up. And I don't want you to stand. They did a song, and I was going to ask them not to do it in the first set and save it for the end, because it just fits. It's Lord, I need you. We can't, do we need to be a community of encouragement? Yeah, we do. It starts with me. Does everybody say that? 
It starts with me. Louder. It starts with me. I can't say this. I can't give what I haven't received. Again. So as we, as we sit here, I want us to have the posture of just saying, Lord, I need you. I need you. I can't do this on my own. I leak. <laughs> you, you might be sitting here going, I don't just leak. I'm, I'm, my battery's dead. And it hasn't been recharged for a long time. And this is where we start. Lord, I need you. I need you to guard, to guide my heart. For me, one of the things that shifted in my life, I just never felt like I had any talents. As a kid, any ability, any intelligence. And I had too many people affirming that. Who am I? What do I have to offer? It was never far from me. And then at the age of 16, even though I was a Christian, I had this encounter with Christ. I heard Jesus speak to me in a way. <clears throat> that I had never heard before. Yes, I was a Christian. Yes, I was going to heaven. But that was it. Then in this moment, I heard Jesus say, Steve, I have a purpose for you. That changed everything. That moment of encouragement changed everything. That moment of Jesus speaking hope, speaking confidence, speaking courage into me changed everything. It changed the trajectory of my life. It appeared to me that scriptures were revealing that God was saying there was more in me than I saw. That he believed in me more than I believed in myself. That I had the potential, that I, could, that I had more potential than I could imagine that me, Steve Brethauer, could make a difference in this world. It was a struggle, but God began to work. I wasn't fully devoted to work behind the scenes. <sighs> Deep within me. But in that moment, I received the courage, and it changed everything. And I believe this. I believe that some of you right now need to stop arguing with God and receive His encouragement. I believe some of you need to stop believing lies and break agreements we have made with our ancient enemy about our value, about our purpose, and our potential. Lies that keep us in bondage. Lies that keep us discouraged and despair. And in despair. And we need to receive God's encouragement because He created you. He loves you. He knows you and values you. And when this lands, when we receive this, when we understand how much encouragement we have from Christ, it changes everything. Therefore, if, any have, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort comes from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness or compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and of one mind. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. I need you, oh, I 
today, my prayer is that you've been encouraged, you know how to become encouraged, and that you go and encourage this week, that we would be a community that breathes hope, that's, that speaks hope, that speaks confidence, that speaks courage, and just speaks of Christ in everything that we do. God bless you, and see you next week.